a clear mind leads to better judgment, leads to better outcome. So a happy, calm, peaceful person will make better decisions and have better outcomes. So if you want to operate at peak performance, you have to learn how to tame your mind, just like you have to learn how to tame your body. Let's go back to desire, right? This is old, old Buddhist wisdom. I'm not saying anything original, but desire to me is a contract that you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. Mm. Okay, and I keep that in front of mind. So when I'm unhappy about something, I look for what is the underlying desire that I have that's not being fulfilled. It's okay to have desires. You're a biological creature. You're put on this earth. You have to do something. You have to have desires. You have a mission. But don't have too many. Don't pick them up unconsciously. Don't pick them up randomly. Don't have thousands of them. My coffee is too cold. Doesn't taste quite right. I'm not sitting perfectly. Oh, I wish it were warmer. Uh, you know, oh, my dog, you know, pooped in the lawn. I don't like that. Whatever it is. Pick your one overwhelming desire, and it's okay to suffer over that one. But on all the others, you want to let them go so you can be calm and peaceful and relaxed. And then you'll perform a better job. Mm. Most people, when you're unhappy, like a depressed person, it's not that they have a very clear, calm mind. They're too busy in their mind. Their sense of self is too strong. They're sitting indoors all the time. Their mind's working, working, working. They're thinking too much. Well, if you want to be a high-performance athlete, how good of an athlete are you going to be if you're always having epileptic seizures, if you're always like twitching and running around and like jumping and your, your, your limbs are flailing out of control? The same way, if you want to be effective in business, you need a clear, calm, cool, collected mind. Warren Buffett plays bridge all day long and goes for a walk in the sun. He doesn't sit around like constantly loading his brain with nonstop information and, 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 and getting worked up about every little thing. We live in an age of infinite leverage. What I mean by that is that your actions can be multiplied a thousandfold, either by broadcasting at a podcast or by investing capital or by having people work for you or by writing code. So because of that, the impacts of good decision making are much higher than they used to be because now you can influence thousands or millions of people through your decisions or your code. So a clear mind leads to better judgment, leads to better outcome. So a happy, calm, peaceful person will make better decisions and have better outcomes. So if you want to operate at peak performance, you have to learn how to tame your mind, just like you have to learn how to tame your body. So assuming that your goal is, your, your motivation is intrinsic, you're doing the thing because you love it or because you really want it, and you can separate that motivation from anxiety then I think you can take on certain superpowers. And we kind of all intrinsically know this. Like if you look at, you know, samurai warriors, right? Like uh, Miyamoto Musashi is in a duel with somebody else. You know that the person who is calmer is going to win. In all those movies, it's the one who can like, who's like, incredibly still, then swipes with a sword incredibly quickly and is then still again. That's the winner, the one who has a zen state of mind. Similarly, in the Terminator movies, part of the reason you fear the Terminator is because he's a robot. He's unstoppable. He's implacable. You can't argue with him. You can't communicate with him. You can't make him slow down. And he has no remorse. He just keeps coming. Or in that old Clint Eastwood movie, Unforgiven, you know, the guy who wins the gunfight is the one who doesn't flinch. He's just keeping his cool while he's loading his gun and shooting. He's not like all over the place running around. So I just think we waste so much energy through anxiety that if you can be calm and still go about your business, it's a superpower. And I, I realized this myself recently where I was in a conflict situation in business. It was a high conflict situation. It was unfortunate. We, I think we've solved it. But as I went through this high conflict situation, I'd been through one like it years before where I was much more anxious. And I remember that time period. And I remember how much I was sweating it and how nervous I was and how I went through bouts of fear and anger and, and uh, how kind of worked up I was the entire time, intense and didn't get much sleep. But this time I was incredibly calm and I was almost enjoying it because it was like practicing my craft now of course it's easy to do now because I have more money but at the same time it, it just didn't bother me it was just very mechanical and because of that I could be very effective about it and I could be effective about it while doing lots and lots of other things my mind wasn't constantly spinning in a whirlpool taking on 10 different problems and just fear-based scenario planning all the time most of these things were never going to happen so I do believe that being calm and still going about your business is the superpower now yes if anxiety is your only motivator then you have a problem but I would argue the pure motivations don't come out of anxiety. So let's talk about attribution here. To what would you attribute 
the and I know this that it's difficult to isolate variables, et cetera. But if let's just say like you have a family, so let's just say one of your kids comes to you, it's like, Dad, I'm suffering from a lot of anxiety. What should I do? Or you observe it and you want to help your kid out. What types of recommendations would you make? Or might you make? Uh, another question, if you prefer it, is what has helped you to go from the whirlpool experience of anxiety in high conflict experience round one versus calm Naval in high conflict experience round two? Yeah, it's really hard to separate all the pieces out. I mean, it comes from a combination of philosophy, yoga, meditation, getting older, having kids, you know, like you, I've, I've had some psychedelic experiences, uh, but those are very far back in the past. Um, just a distant memory at this point. But I would say the number one thing that has been very, very important for me is meditation. And it's a stupid thing to say because it's so trite. Everybody just says it now. But when I say meditation, I don't mean sitting there and watching your breath or chanting a mantra. I mean self-examination. And meditation is a great way to do that, self-therapy. It's sitting there with your thoughts. So anxiety, the, the anxiety, anxiety this, this pervasive, non-specific anxiety, where we're just constantly on edge about everything, that comes from an unexamined life. You know, I think was a Socrates said like an unexamined life is not worth living. I forget who said that quote. Something but, like that. Yeah, yeah, but it's a it's Aristotle, a great, Socrates, one of one those. One of those. Yeah, one of those smart philosopher types. But it's correct. It's your unexamined life that is causing the problems, and you can examine it in multiple ways. You can examine it through. You can have some crazy mushroom trip where it all comes out one night. You could do a lot of meditation, sitting there with yourself and letting your mind run crazy, and then seeing what's actually in your mind that your mind wants to tell you and have you listen to and have you resolve that is unresolved. It could be through therapy. Um, it could be through reading lots of philosophy and reflection and long walks. So there's many, many ways to tackle it. But it's that spending that time with yourself to examine why are you having these thoughts. Think about it this way. We spend so much time in our relationships, our relationship with our wives, our relationship with our colleagues, our relationship with our business partners, our relationship with our friends. The most important relationship you have is with yourself. It's with this voice in your head that is constantly rattling every waking hour. It's this crazy roommate living inside your mind who's always chattering, always chattering, and never shuts up. And you can't control these thoughts. They just come up out of you don't even know where. That quality of those quality of your thoughts, that convers those conversations you're having in your head all the time, that is your world. That is the world you live in. Those that's the worldview you have, that's the lenses you see through, and that's going to determine the quality of your life more than anything else. And if you want to see what the quality of your life actually is, put down the drink, put down the computer, put down the smartphone, put down the book, put down the headphones. Just sit by yourself doing nothing. And then you will know what the quality of your life actually is because that's what you're always running away from. That's why people, when they try to meditate, they sit down like, I, I hate it, I can't sit still. Why? Because your mind is eating you alive. Your life is unexamined. Your mind is running in loops over things that it has not resolved. And because they're not resolved, when you run around in your normal life, it's not those problems have gone away. It's that they're just there. They're there, and, but they're provoking anxiety. And what you think of as the anxiety that's that's kind of consuming you and you can't identify the source, that's just the tip of an iceberg poking out from underneath the water. And underneath is a giant pile of garbage of decisions that were made without too much thought of situations that you're in that you haven't resolved that you need to resolve of problems that you have or desires that you have that have gone unmet or unmanifested or, or contradictions that you're living in or ways that you which you feel trapped so proper meditation proper examination should ruin the life that you're currently living it should cause you to leave relationships it should cause you to re-establish boundaries with family members and with colleagues it should cause you to quit your job it should cause you to change your eating patterns it should cause you to spend more time with yourself it should cause you to change what books you read it should cause you to change who your friends are if it doesn't do that it's not real examination if it doesn't come attached with destruction of your current life then you can't create the new life in which you will not have the anxiety if you look at the greatest competitors in the world, greatest physical like athletes, Marcelo Garcia, who, who's a, who I trained with for many years, who I own a jiu-jitsu school within the city, um, if you, he's probably the greatest grappler to ever live. And if you watch Marcelo in a world championship, he would be sleeping literally minutes before um, a Mundial's semifinal or final. Sleeping. And, but you've never seen anyone turn it on more intensely. 
And if you look at great fighters, people think fighters are like jacked and tense, and, uh, but they're not. Like, they're actually very relaxed. The greatest fighters are super relaxed when they're not fighting. But when they're in the, the battle, you wouldn't believe the intensity. And even to deconstruct that further, if you watch a, a great, for example, boxer, the relaxation before a strike is delivered is incredible. So it's just the undulation. Like most people in high stress decision making industries are always operating at this kind of simmering six or four as opposed to the undulation between just deep relaxation and being at a 10. And being at a 10 is like millions of times better than being at a six. It's not, a, it's just a different universe. Same, same as being all in on a discipline is millions of times more intense than being, you know, 98 or 99 percent, let alone, you know, I could take it or leave it. Yeah. And just having observed you, observed Marcelo, yeah. uh, certainly heard stories about, say, Floyd Mayweather before gigantic fights. Yeah. And uh, I heard a friend of mine who knows him said he walked into his dressing room after Floyd was like, yeah, sure, come on in. He's like, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you. I, I, you must be <laughs> prepping. And he's like, no, I'm either ready or I'm not. And he was just yes. sitting down watching some TV. Yeah. <laughs> that it's, it's, in a way your ability to avoid the simmering six uh, directly affects your ability to then ratchet up to turn on to the 99% or the 100%. Right? And if you're always at a simmering six, you're just at 50% battery right. all the time. 100% and 50% intensity. Yeah. And you cannot, you have no idea what your 10 is. 